Thank you for joining us for Everything Under the Sun, the AccuWeather podcast. I'm your host, meteorologist Regina Miller, joined in the studio, as always, by my producer extraordinaire, Andy Robb. <laughs> and I'm also joined, I'm really excited this week, because I have Manuel Crespo in the studio, and he is a uh, journalist with AccuWeather.com, and also a journalist in Espanol with AccuWeather.com, and Jonathan Petromala, who is one of our reporters for the AccuWeather Network, and he's out live on the scene. You can see him very often on the AccuWeather Network with some major stories. And this is actually the first time he's actually in the studio with us, because he's appeared on the show a few times. So right. It's great to have him here. He's finally. always out on the road. He's yeah. always out with a suitcase somewhere. Wherever so, the weather's the worst. <laughs> right, wherever the weather's so thank you guys for joining us this week. Thank you for having us here. Thanks for bringing me in out of the cold. I know you got an excuse to come in the studio. Yeah. So well, out of the snow. This week is really great because you guys have done a series on AccuWeather, uh, the AccuWeather Network, and you guys were back in Puerto Rico checking on the art of recovery. AccuWeather presents the art of recovery, Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria. 18 months after Hurricane Maria, I went back to Puerto Rico and saw a rebirth underway. Right now, 85% of the food on the island is imported. That's going to change. There is a real momentum in getting the island back on its feet. All I want to think is about the future and about how to bring happiness back to, to the people. So I wanted to bring you guys both in and talk about that. So Manuel, you were there during the hurricane. You're from Puerto Rico. And so I thought, and I know, Jonathan, you were there immediately after the hurricane. So before we kind of dive into how the island is recovering and some of the new innovative ways they're doing that, I wanted to talk to you guys both about the hurricane and the aftermath and kind of paint the picture of that for me. So basically, um, as you say, I was there. Um, I was with my family. I live in a town called Aguada. It's located in the west side of the island. And spent there like around four months before migrating here to the States to work with AccuWeather. And yeah, I mean, all you have seen in the media, all those pictures, I think it doesn't make justice at all of like the suffering and the real struggles that Puerto Rican people went through. Um, right. There were a lot of people that, that, you know, we were prepared at my home. We were prepared to, to, to confront a hurricane, but there were a lot of people who struggle a lot um, to survive every day. Last year, we went there on the first anniversary, mm -hmm. and we covered stories focused on how after a year, people were still in need, and a, still, a, a lot of things still needed to be done there. But this year, we tried to make something different. We tried to focus on the recovery and how, even though we went through something really, really, really bad, we're making something not like what it was before, but way much better than it was. Well, I've seen some of the stories too, Jonathan, and, and Manuel kind of led you around and, and gave you some ideas on the places to hit there, right? Yeah, I think that what made the stories unique is that you haven't seen these angles before on any other network. And it's it was an important story to tell. The Art of the Recovery is the name of the series, and the reason why it was it was kind of based off of what Lin Manuel Miranda from Hamilton fame did. He did you get to the, meet him while you were there? Uh, we didn't. We just we, <laughs> we met uh, we met a few cast members. So fantastic. He, he, he was like really really busy. He was very <laughs> over, it was very overwhelming. Did you guys tell me you're from AccuWeather? <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we dropped the AccuWeather card, did and you? it didn't it, it did, didn't, it didn't no, work. No, it didn't work this time. But so. uh, I'm sure when there's a weather some, a weather event, he's gonna go to the AccuWeather app. I'm sure. But, yeah. Uh, so the art of the recovery comes from that because he brought Hamilton to the island to show the importance of arts in the recovery process. And, you know, the recovery is more than just your infrastructure. It's also a spirit thing. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of people's spirits were broken by the, the hurricane, just like the infrastructure was there. And the arts are playing a really important role in helping that island to g regain that soul that right. it, it had before. The, you know, the Puerto Rican people love music, they love food, they love dancing, they love laughing. Very colorful. Very it's, I mean, colorful. just very colorful people, you know? Yeah. So. And, and so not only were they hit with this hurricane, but politically they've been going through austerity measures due to budget crises. And so it was kind of a combination, a true perfect storm that really led to Puerto Rico to where it is and where it's, where it's going now. And so it, it kind of exemplified the, 
the spirit of, of Puerto Rico and the recovery just by watching these arts uh, from the plays to the artists who are making graffiti to just the average everyday p- person and their role in, in, in the recovery of the island. And it's amazing to see a year and a half later how much different it is than just a year later. And mm-hmm. just adding a little bit of what you just said, um, I think what really made this series very special is that we not only provided a vision of that moment, with our stories we were able to provide some context of what was happening before, why the hurricane was so bad, you know, there mm-hmm. were political reasons, his history reasons, and we were able to capture that in each one of our stories and, you know, give like a flashback of what, how were, were things before and how they are now and a little bit uh, guess how they're going to be in the future. Do you think, uh, you know, Manuel, because I, I had seen there were the political struggles and some of the things that were going on there kind of led to things not getting off the ground with recovery as quickly initially, right? Did that kind of, the storm kind of just showed how bad that was. Yeah, uh, definitely. Like this just shows all the struggles that we have been um, dealing with for years. Like uh, we have a weak energetic system. Um, we have a huge poverty rate, like more than half of the population are under the, the poverty um, level, uh, which is like the highest in all the U.S. And that was before, it, that was before, it was before the, the hurricane. hurricane. These were problems that existed before. Exactly, but never the world was looking at Puerto Rico for more than, let's say, like international artists or, you know, all these things that make our island really beautiful. Mm-hmm. But we were struggling there, you know, and the hurricane, I think that that was one of the best things that it did for us, like showcase all the struggles. And also for us, for us as locals to realize, hey, we have a problem here. And I think it's time to make something better out of it. And I think that's also what we showed. Speaking of yeah. making something better out of it, it wasn't just uh, going in, showing the problems and then walking away. We were able to go in, show the problems and show some of the solutions that the people themselves are leading. So the people are taking care of themselves in different ways that I think shows and speaks to a possible brighter future for the island. You know, things like solar power. Um, There was another story we did. We named it the Tired Town where they used recyclables and basically trash. I call it landfill living. Right. They were able to take what you would literally put in a landfill and create hurricane proof homes. Right. So things like this, there's a change in perspective that, you know, you have a society that is based and steeped in tradition. There's a Spanish tradition is very, very heavy there. And now they're thinking outside of that and they're they're willing to take a chance on something sustainable that likely makes more sense in especially an island that's so isolated they need to be able to help themselves in a lot of cases. And, and so this is some of, these are some of the highlighting, the stories that we were able to highlight. Tell me about, because one of the stories, you know, I was checking out some of the stories that appeared on the AccuWeather Network and um, agriculture. So let's talk about how that changed and their mindset on how to handle agriculture after the hurricane. So basically Puerto Rico import 85% of all that we consume, which is like a lot. You know, yes, right. Produ- an island producing like only fifty percent of what we produce, what we consume, is is not a lot. And Hurricane Maria made us uh, realize that we need to change that equation because in you know if uh, a future disaster occurs, we are not going to have food. You know, we we will need to to wait for uh, ships to come to the island to bring food, and that in that process, a lot of people are going to struggle a lot. Right. So now basically what people are doing are moving to more sustainable ways of producing agriculture. And the same thing is just repeating, like not what the same structure that we had before, but something better with incorporating solar panels to agriculture to make it um, more resistant uh, places to to uh, gather all the, the you know, the products that, that we oh, produce. So they're using the solar panels with, in addition to the agriculture. Yeah. I was thinking they were using them, you know, for businesses or, or homes. They're trying to do that, but they're using it with the agriculture yeah, as they, well. They are just changing the mindset in things that in case a hurricane or an, earth, an earthquake or a natural disaster happens there, we will still be able to, you know, keep producing and keep moving forward the country. And we, we spoke with the Minister of Agriculture there in Puerto Rico, and that was one of his the things that he highlighted was the fact that you have a weak power grid. Mm -hmm. And if you have a weak power grid that's going to be knocked offline for a month after a hurricane or an earthquake, which is another natural disaster that Puerto Rico is very susceptible to, it's not really talked about a lot, but 
you need to be able to have electricity to run the pumps, to water the plants, to be able to, um, you also need buildings that are hardened that aren't going to be collapsing on top of equipment like tractors that they need to use to um, take the crops out of the field. So they're focusing not necessarily on rebuilding to what it was. They're trying to rebuild for a future where if a disaster happens, they can get back online a lot more quickly. And even though they're going to be producing maybe a quarter of the food that the island needs, that's a lot more than they were able to do before. Because right, because they were kind of just at the mercy of waiting for, for things to come yeah. in. And so, yeah. so like, the solar power, like you said, um, they'll use it to kind yeah, of run, run irrigation pumps, pumps. But also, and, they're probably mm-hmm. trying to store a good deal of food, and I would imagine you have to have, you yeah, know, FEMA, places like Yeah, FEMA that. admits, one of the things they do admit is that they did not have enough supplies on the island. And unlike mm-hmm. a disaster that hits in the United States mainland, where there's states that are contiguous, mm-hmm. where you could just drive in, you have to wait for ships to come in. And so that was part of the problems that they faced, at least for the first two to three weeks in Puerto Rico, is that they were waiting for those ships to come into port. Plus, you got to imagine those ports were damaged as well. So there was a lot of issues uh, logistically that they were having to deal with. So if you have a hurricane-hardened infrastructure for something as critical as food and water, that helps the recovery process speed up and people aren't quite in the desperate straits that they were after Hurricane Maria. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, I saw power and energy that that's one of the stories you focused on, you know, so we had the agriculture, how solar and how solar power is being used to help that. But also you're, you focused on them using that for all sorts of homes and businesses as a new kind of model, right? Yeah. Casa Pueblo in uh, Agodia. Right. In, in Adjuntas. Adjuntas. Sorry. Yeah, in the Adjuntas, center yeah. of the Adjuntas, island. Yeah. This organization, they have been um, producing uh, solar energy uh, since 99, I guess. Yeah, I, I, 99. It's been 99. 20 years. 20 yeah. years already. And if there's one thing Puerto Rico has a lot of, it's sunshine. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> right. And they were for years telling people, hey, this is an option, this is an option. And it was not until the hurricane impacted the island that people realized, oh, this was the real option. Because in the middle of the mountain, like, in the middle of nowhere, like even for us, like a year and a half later of the hurricane, going there, it was really difficult to get there because it's a very rural area. Um, Windiest road I've ever seen yeah, in my life. Really? It was insane. And it's just like difficult roads, you know, the, the topography. So you four wheel drive, narrow, or how did you guys get up in there? A Jeep, and you oh, just okay. hope that a semi is not a coming t- the other way. A lot of it's, faith. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it's very. <laughs> but we, we made it, and, and we saw uh, like, how this organization is how they call it is starting the energetic insurrection from the island from from the mountains of the island and basically people were going there to this place uh like a very simple home yeah casa pueblo is just an old 1800s late 1800s home that they converted into you uh, basically an educational center so there's they've really focused on sustainability for like i said at least two to three decades since it was mm-hmm. founded wow and um so after the hurricane they were able to pop the lights back on the next day their infrastructure was not damaged by the hurricane so people in wow. this small rural mountain town were able to come in charge their phones hook up their dilate dilation devices what, whatever that they needed medically um get fresh water they had air conditioning. They had a movie theater that's powered by... Are you by serious? That's they, incredible. They even have a radio station. It was the only radio station working at the moment because the it was solar-powered. The only way they could get powered. news, yeah. So it was basically an energy um, oasis and also, also an example of what you can do if you rely in this kind of um, energy, you know? Yeah. And then they started acquire, acquiring um, funds from Lee Manuel's um, fathers, oh. fathers the Hispanic of Federation. the Hispanic mm-hmm. Federation. Because that's what Lynn Manuel was raising money for, was mm-hmm. that, exactly. that exactly. group, right? Among, yeah. among other things. Okay. And they were they begin like providing people with solar flashlights and then they acquire um, solar uh, fridges, refrigerators, so, so people can get food in there or maybe keep medicine keep cold. medicines yeah, there. Yeah, right. Yeah. And that way, little by little, it has been growing and growing, and they have basically changed the energetic uh, infrastructure of a whole town. Like, so wow. they focused their efforts small. They figure if we can change one small part of this island, and the rest of the island looks at this as an example, that hey, maybe we should look at this in our the other parts of the island. Yeah. The uh, one of the founders of Casa Pueblo, he mentioned an 
what he called an energy insurrection, and that's really what it is. They're trying to fight the standard way of doing business that it hasn't worked and is not working really well on the island. And so he's put the solar panels in places like grocery stores. So if a hurricane were to happen again or an earthquake, there's still going to be refrigerated right. food. And so these people that are in a very hard-to-get-to part of the island can still have food for a week. So they've had this there for a while, but do you think um, do you think there was like a little bit of complacency about moving forward with the new technology for a while until you find that the old technology doesn't work anymore? I think it was a lot of resistance because... If you are born and raised thinking that things are just meant to be done one way, okay, you're just gonna stick with that, right? And maybe you will think, oh, that is not possible, or that is gonna be too expensive for me yes. to do. But once you are in the necessity of acquiring that kind of service and you do it, and you see, oh, this works, and it actually saving me money. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I it, saw you guys had like a barbershop where the guys yeah. like I have I don't pay hardly anything. Yeah, I on I that was an important right? uh, vehicle to help tell that story because speaking of tradition, this guy is been a barber for 40 years yeah 40 years he's 73 years like his father was a barber his brothers were barbers his sons are barbers i mean and there's nothing more traditional in that culture than yeah. a barber shop and that's why one, that's one of the places that they put the solar panels on the barber shop because that's such an important part it's of, like a cultural of thing society. like you go hang out yeah. and like talk and you know everybody knows and each so other so he's he was one of the choices to put the solar power because it is such an important part of Puerto Rican society and so, he's this guy so who, yeah. if he was able to transform his mindset to you know acquire that kind of solar power everyone can do and that is basically yes. what Casa Pueblo is is doing through the island now this next um, April 21st, they have like um, a manifestation to keep spreading that uh, example in other parts of the island. And it's a very nice project that we need to keep um, the trace of it because I think it's going to be getting great results, the energy and how it's being dealt with energy in the island. And you well, felt a confidence too from the people. They were yeah. very confident for the next disaster that they were going to be okay, that they were going to have a barbershop. They were going to have groceries. They were going to have a fire station that still worked. They were going to have a hospital that still had power. Restaurants, I mean, Restaurants. So, you know, you felt a, a confidence that you didn't really feel when you go to other parts of the island that they know, and FEMA will even tell you, bad thunderstorm will knock out the power for days. And there's still roving blackouts yeah. in parts of the island. I mean, it's just, it's a way of life there. Right. People have gotten used to it. Yeah. So there's some excitement about around these projects, and it's probably really inspiring because really if if puerto rico continues to adopt these in other areas they're like a model for like even like countries that don't deal with the process like why aren't we doing more (laughs) you know like we could do more than of that you know right right here in the i I think that unfortunately natural disasters are some of our best teachers really yeah you know a great example more recently was hurricane michael and the panhandle and that was a part of florida that was probably the most susceptible in terms of that kind of destruction just because codes in that part of Florida were never as strong as, for instance, they were in South Florida due to Hurricane Andrew back in the early 90s. That's when codes were increased, structures were built better. Well, that didn't really happen in the panhandle Mm -hmm. because a strong hurricane's never hit there before in, in living memory. And so maybe the devastation wouldn't have been as bad if you had the the stronger codes. And of course, now that this has happened, codes are going to be better in that part of the state, et cetera, et cetera. You're right. Crisis does lead to sometimes our best changes. And we just wanted to remind our listeners, we're speaking with Manuel Crespo, a writer for AccuWeather.com and AccuWeather in Espanol, as well as Jonathan Petromala, a reporter for the AccuWeather Network about their experiences in Puerto Rico. Tell me also about the, which I thought this was absolutely fascinating, and um, the trash being used to create these shelters. Talk to me about that. I mean, um, Puerto Rico has like two big um, situations, troubles, let's call them. One is having structures that are resistant to hurricanes or earthquakes or any other natural disaster. And also production of trash. We are an island and we produce a lot of trash. And what do we do to solve those problems? Well, this organization come to the island after the hurricane and say, hey, let's build ha- houses that are hurricane resistant, earthquake resistance using trash. Isn't it that amazing? So yes. basically this in this town, um, they have gathered like old tires, um, 
plastic bottles, trash uh, cans. Beer bottles. Beer A lot of beer bottles. bottles in Puerto yeah. Rico. <laughs> and they're transforming them into houses. It's just, I cannot explain it with words. It's just something that you need to see because it's just mind-blowing, right? And it's the name of the, the organization's Earthship Biotexture. They're actually out of Taos, New Mexico. And when we first walked over the hill and you see the, the designs, it looks like a science fiction uh, village just by the, the odd designs and, and the otherworldliness of it. And talking to the organizers there, they literally had the town just bring dump trucks, that they, their trash cans, yeah. the, the trash trucks that they would pick up the trash. Yes. And instead of taking it to the um, landfill, they just said, just dump it here. And they're like, Nobody really? wants you trash want just, just to dump <laughs> and they, were the they were happy. They were happy. Right. About, they're you know, like, yay, more trash. Tra- here comes the it. trash and, truck. Uh, yay. You know, they used every bit of from the, the beer bottles to the plastic cans, and each had a specific. It's not just, oh, we're incorporating. No, like, uh, they have a specific reason why this is actually a pretty good material yeah. for sustainability. And it was it's fascinating. It's an interesting story to watch. But so, like, for example, like you would say, like tires are more suited to for a specific part of this structure, whereas aluminum cans are, exactly. are different. Like tires are made f- mostly for the walls. And it helps because it gives the, the shape of like a dome. And if, uh, uh, let's say, a 200 mile when it comes, it will just go through it because, you know, it, it just... Oh, it goes go. up and over it. Exactly. It kind of goes... Aerodynamics. Aerodynamics, yeah. 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 And also, if a, uh, an earthquake occurs, well, you know, they kind of will move with the earth. Right, because it's rubber. It's rubber. So there's ability to kind of, mm-hmm. like, kind of shift yeah. without the plastic, breaking it. Plastic bottles, for instance, help with the connecti- or convectivity of the air conditioning unit that they used. It's not an electric air conditioning. It's a physics thing that I would need to go to school for another probably six to eight years <laughs> to really describe to you guys well. Wow. But it, there's a specific purpose to it, and it, it provides an ins- basically an insulation to help uh, protect the interior of the structure from the hot Puerto Which Rican is perfect sun. because yeah. weather in Puerto Rico is really, really hot. So. Yeah. And so so when I was looking, because I was, I was checking out the video online, and I know Jonathan on your, Jonathan Petromala, his uh, storyteller page on Facebook, you can see some of these videos. Um, but I saw how they kind of were... Like, just to explain, it, it almost looked like a, a, a concrete dome, or it reminded me of, like, old adobe, but it was mm-hmm. kind of dome-shaped, but they would use the plastic bottles, and they that might be a row, and then it would be, like, slathered with some kind of And material. I'm not an architecture major by any stretch, but you can definitely see, as you mentioned, the adobe. Like, you can that see that American sense, yeah. You can see that American Southwest and, and Pueblo Indian um, s- type of architecture kind of being transformed and used here in... Puerto Rico and it looks out of place but it makes sense and this is not something again that the people are going to live there in that part of Puerto Rico the hope is that it's going to be an educational village that just the pure oddity of it brings people in and then the what we were talking about earlier how people are maybe at this point willing to be more open-minded about changes Mm -hmm. and they can see something within the structure or within one of the devices that they're they're using like the um, energy production with the solar or the wastewater treatment uh, production there's so many little things that maybe they could incorporate into their own home that mm-hmm. exists and that could help so yeah, definitely right. small steps that will make a huge different uh, right. difference in, in, in locals definitely worth a watch though yeah. yeah one of the other segments that that you guys covered which i thought was pretty interesting was art and culture and how they're uh, going in and, and repainting art on a lot of these buildings that tell the story of Puerto Rico's struggle. Because I saw the one, one of the artists was talking about disaster capitalism. So talk to me a little bit about that because, okay, so I'm back home. I see Puerto Rico and what was happening there. So you're wanting to donate money and you're doing things and, and you're finding out that he called it disaster capitalism because there were a, a lot of ways in which folks were kind of taken advantage of at that time, right? Yeah, basically this, uh, talking specifically about this story, it, it develops in Santurce, which is like a, a barrio, a neighborhood in the capital. Okay. Um, it, giving a little bit of context, back in the days it used to be like a very poor site, um, a lot of violence, but now with art, like since 2009, this group of artists called Santurce Esley has been transforming everything, bringing art to the streets, bringing art festivals. And that is kind of reactivated the, the community, you know, the economic activity there. 
And now it's another thing. It's safe to be there, a lot of dancing, a lot of culture, a lot of paintings. Um, but after the hurricane, a lot of these murals were affected by the hurricane. Um, yeah, they're outdoors. Yeah, they are so those. So, so the mural, so murals were damaged. Yeah, the yeah. wind, the knocked over buildings, tore off roofs, mm -hmm. stripped away the paint. So basically, wow. it, it has acquired a new definition of like how they have been reconstructing um, these murals while also giving a space for artists to say, hey, this also happened in the country. This troubles were saw after the hurricane like people coming from the united states maybe to incorporate companies here to take advantage of the locals mm -hmm. and it's a way of criticizing like things that were happening in the island and that maybe you will not see in the newspaper but if you go to that place and you see an art uh an, an artistic expression you will be able to notice like the vision of the artist and i, I think it, it was a really nice story to tell art and protest goes hand in hand throughout it history has, it yes. always has and this form of art is about as public as you can be because it's outside uh, you know anybody who's driving by or walking by will see it so in the artist we specifically spoke with who painted the mural that we were, were referring to it um he wanted it to be as clear as possible so it is it's, it's very obvious what it is he used elements of historical propaganda like you would see from the soviet union or nazi germany or even the united states and he made it about as clear as possible where people essentially were hiding behind religion and capitalism so he used the white collar shirt mm -hmm. but he put on the the ski mask to show that this guy's actually um, a, a thief, crook. a crook. Yeah. You know, he's wearing the the white collar shirt and he's reading out of a Bible, and preaching to the to the rest of the island. This is actually a criminal, and he's taking advantage of of the people. So that's just one of the examples um, in this neighborhood, and and it's a, it's a very powerful piece, and it's one of those pieces that you don't have to explain. You can walk up to it and you can yeah. see it and you, yeah. you understand yeah. where, where he's coming from right. and why he would be angry. And mm -hmm. and again, you know, pictures are worth and more than words. Right? It was incredibly striking. Um, and in some ways, I would imagine like that kind of that kind of art is is very therapeutic in a way. And too. what is impressive about this is that you don't need words. You know, art is universal. So every people from every country can go there and they will understand the message because it's not something written in Spanish or in English, you know, it's kind of universal. And after taking a year off, uh, Santurce Esle had an, another festival in December, and so the murals that were damaged, new ones have taken their place, and so the neighborhood has transformed once again to become that colorful stop for Instagram as you want to do the walking tours, and you can see the uh, the effects that that has had, you know, small businesses opening up, little bars here, little restaurants there that are thriving once again because of the painting on the, the buildings. Sort of like almost like embracing your past, but also really looking towards the future. Yeah, yeah. and it's it's a healing. I talked about the soul mm -hmm. of Puerto Rico that needed to be healed. And that's a lot of that's through art, which, again, has been hurt by funding talking about the um uh, Lin-Manuel. The, the, well, the Lin-Manuel, and, and that's part of the reason why I was there, to help fund the arts, because that's been cut during the, you know, the, uh, the government um, restrictions that they've been under before the hurricane even. Art's mm -hmm. one of the first things to go in any it any government is, right. cuts, right? <laughs> and so this this is just an example of why the arts are important to people's spirits and souls. Lin-Manuel and Hamilton and the thousands of people that he drew into the island and the millions of dollars that he was able to raise for the arts in Puerto Rico. And um, we spoke with King George II, who's he's the only Puerto Rican born actor. And he, yep. And he grew up just right by the, by the uh, uh, art center where the, yeah. the play was held. And he spoke to the importance of leaving a legacy. Mm -hmm. You know, he's made a good career out of it and he wants to, you know, there's so much talent on that island and it's, it's good to see that, Hopefully that'll help that schools that maybe have closed down, there'll still be some programs out there for kids to have an outlet for their creative expression. I also wanted to ask, what are living conditions like now on the island? How would you how would you describe maybe the percentage of the island that's really in some really good recovery, maybe versus I mean in comparison of what it was at the beginning, yes. You have been making a great advance you know mm -hmm. there are obviously less people um, struggling with electricity or water because almost all of that has been restored but that doesn't mean that because um, more people are back to track uh, mm -hmm. other people are still struggling for example we went 
to Vega Alta, which is Lin Manuel's hometown, and mm -hmm. we went to a, a very touristic place where tourists were coming. Like, hey, this is where Lin Manuel was grown, and they have like a big mural of with his face. You know, something really, really nice. But I don't know, maybe five, seven minutes from there, we went to a neighborhood and you still can see the blue tarps. We narrate in one of the stories, the story of Giovanni Barreto, he is a local, and he basically lost everything, and they, FEMA just gave him like $2,000, you know, and you cannot reconstruct a home um, right. with that. And you know, this kind of stories still s say us that there's a lot need to be done in, in the island. Mm -hmm. And as an outsider showing up, you, you arrive and you wonder, all right, was this hurricane damage or was this neglect? Yeah. Because the, you know, there's a lot of infrastructure that has been neglected for, for years and years and years in Puerto Rico. And um, so that's, again, the problem was just exacerbated by Hurricane Maria. But what was incredible is seeing it a year afterwards and then six months later, there's a major difference. Yeah. A great example, the San Sebastian Festival happens every year in January. And this year's festival, I talked to a lot of folks who were there. They couldn't tell a hurricane had happened. Wow. Uh, you know, San Juan, old San Juan, where most of the tourists visit on the cruise ships and come in. It, it, they've really done an amazing job. I think that it's, it's kind of back to where it was. And the festival was a massive success. And we did a story where we spoke with the First Lady of Puerto Rico. And, and one of her initiatives as well was to bring more arts Mm -hmm. into the community and to get people to maybe leave San Juan and, and support small business in other parts yeah. of the island. That's why we're we're putting art everywhere. We're doing art with meaning. It's not just art because of art. It's something that needs to make people feel something. Paseo de Sombrias are umbrellas that float over the street leading up to the governor's mansion, inspiring countless selfies. And Rosello hopes a desire to take off and explore every corner of the island. From devastatingly beautiful beaches to majestic mountains, Puerto Rico is an insanely Instagrammable island. And, um, you know, it is such an incredible island with so much beauty that the New York Times named it the most, it, this is where you should go, number one in mm -hmm. the world, Puerto Rico. And there's the reason is it's because of its, its culture and its, its really authentic experiences you can have there, like the San Sebastian Festival. And um, they're ready. They're ready for people to come back and visit. So if you haven't... I'm ready to go. You visit. should definitely what do you visit. Say, Andy? <laughs> if you have, you should Absolutely. give it. I'm in. Yeah. I'm in. It's not because <laughs> I am from there, but that is the best place on earth. Believe yeah. me, it's the best place uh, well, on earth. You, you, you like you've mountains? convinced me. I, yeah. I, I'm going to check it out. I'm going to go check out the food. I'm going to go check out the all art, the culture. Yeah, and also just to see the spirit of people just getting back to track. Like, hey, this is our island. Um, this is the only thing that we have. And even though you can have a very deep economical crisis, political crisis. Still, we're still struggling with that, and, and we are going to make something better. And they definitely have a different standard of living there, mm -hmm. um, and it's a shame. It's, it's sad to see, but they have also a real authentic joy mm -hmm. that is something that's worthwhile to experience, and it was really nice to see, especially during the San Sebastian Festival, watching everybody dance and everybody laugh and everybody scream, and it was just like you could tell it was a very cathartic experience because the year, the year previously... They didn't really have electricity yet. There was yeah, still a lot of damage. There was a lot there was of just a, uh, trauma almost. Trauma. It was like a yeah. it was like an absolute cultural trauma yeah. for yeah. some some time there. So it's it's exciting to see and, and definitely if you can go yeah. go. It's it's worthwhile. Maybe instead of going to Mexico or whatever, maybe check out Puerto Rico if you want to go see a definitely. beach. Yeah, definitely. Right now, one more question I have is because we're uh, approaching the hurricane season. How are how are people getting ready or feeling about that? Well, I mean, this is something that will live forever in our minds in, and in the minds of, of people there, um, that we need to be prepared, you know. We need to be prepared to, to pass weeks without food or energy. And I think that with this um, Syria, we capture that, that feeling of recovering, but also being prepared of what is coming to the future. Um, I guess that the trauma is always going to be there and every hurricane season is going to create a big stress on mm -hmm. locals but now we know what to expect and how to be prepared about that mm -hmm. so i'm pretty sure that in the future things can be bad but not as bad as hurricane maria speaking with the director of fema there on the island he's still really worried about the island in general in terms of preparedness because there hasn't been a tradition of preparedness on the island and sometimes they get more into panic mode than preparedness mode 
And I, I think that through our stories, through other stories, through experiences, hopefully people will understand that if you prepare a little bit at a time, eventually you're prepared. Yeah. Rather than just, you don't have to rush out all at once and buy a million dollars worth of things if you just go a little bit at a right. time. Right, how do you eat an elephant? I mean, it's just uh, one, bite one bite at a time. time. You exactly. can only do, exactly. you know, do so, it one step But what is important is that it, that change is happening. Yes. Yes. It's happening and people are realizing that. And they're taking it seriously. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> well, and it must be inspiring for you, Manuel, because I think to you have a unique opportunity traveling with Jonathan and talking to different heads of different uh, either organizations that are helping or, you know, government heads. Like, you get a chance to see your island and all the progress going all over the place, and it's probably really inspiring to you to go back home Yeah, I mean, for me as a journalist, it has been, like, amazing. Um, I mean, it has been difficult because, I mean, after the hurricane, I, I get here to the United States because, you know, things were kind of difficult there right. and I got this opportunity and this has been like a really good way to help the island you know to bring the stories that really matter you do, you know since I was born and raised there um, I know like the struggles that we went through and journalism is all about looking like in the right direction of things not um, focusing on, on, on big aspects but but this little yeah. story simple stories that tell everyday realities and we have been able to to cap her dad in our videos in our stories and i'm really really grateful and happy that we have been um able to to share this two um visits to the island and that the results have both in both occasions has been really really amazing yeah we hope to just tell the human stories yeah we stay away from politics and just let the humans tell the story of you know the struggles that we all could face if we were in their shoes mm -hmm. and how where do they go from there and and the successes and the sadness and mm -hmm. everything in between. And I know I've learned a lot from you guys and uh, from Karuska Matos Horta, yeah. who we uh, interviewed in a past podcast episode because she also hails from Puerto Rico and was like you and came here, uh, you know, Manuel, after the hurricane. So, you know, it really gives us some insight that maybe other people don't always have. So I'm so glad that you guys shared some of these stories. And uh, before we say goodbye, I just wanted to... to let listeners know where they can find these stories. Well, um, basically, they can go to AccuWeather.com um, and type Hurricane Maria, and there's a complete page uh, focused on our past um, coverage and this coverage, and there you can find, like, written articles, not only in English, but also in Spanish for our spanish speaking audiences. Um, and also the videos that Jonathan and Andy Coates, with, he was our videographer, produced. Um, also, you can look in social media, in AccuWeather, AccuWeather in Espanol, in Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, almost every social platforms, as well as in Jonathan's um, Yeah, pages. and social media-wise, uh, the AccuWeather Espanol had a really great uh, way of displaying the story. You should definitely check that out if you have a chance. You don't okay. have to speak Spanish to really appreciate it. It's, yeah, you can go visual. to Instagram to AccuWeather ESP, and there you can look... It's a very creative way of storytelling and like a review of what we covered there. Yeah, so that's a good way to, to review there. Uh, on my own social media, Jonathan Petromala, storyteller. Uh, I share a lot of the stories, not only from Puerto Rico, but of course. All the other storms, because we're so glad speaking, to have you in here. Yeah, <laughs> generally speaking, wherever the weather's the worst, I, I'm there. So if you're interested in weather. Yeah. Blizzard, hurricane. Blizzard, hurricane, haboobs, you know, tornadoes. Snow hail, cane. Yeah, you name it, I've been there. <laughs> right, so, all of them. Yeah. Well, thank you both for joining us. We really appreciate it. It was great talk. Thanks, thank you. Have thank a great you for day. Us. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. Be sure to subscribe to AccuWeather's Everything Under the Sun, giving you the stories behind the weather and so much more. New episodes every Thursday. Just search for AccuWeather on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, or visit accuweather.com slash podcast.